the red flag flying here. Hello, welcome to Socialist Think Tank. Today we are here with Neil Gibb. Hello, Neil. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'm absolutely fine, and thanks for coming and doing this. So I'm going to go straight into the question we always ask our guests. What is socialism to you? Well, I was pre-warned because I've, I've watched a couple of the other episodes, and I'm not going to dodge that question, but I, I do think that almost the problem that this thing called socialism has at the moment is answering that question, because everyone's got a view and instantly you give your point of view, it starts an argument, you know. So um, so I, I really I'm interested in talking about what socialism can be become. But if I kind of you know, go around to answer your question, if I look at the world at the moment in terms of where is something like socialism happening or where has it happened recently, you know, and um, you can see it in, um, obviously there was Eastern Europe, there was this thing called socialism there that, that uh, certainly was in the title in sort of Russia and Eastern European countries. Um, we've seen socialist parties across Western Europe, although they tend to be quite sort of liberal in the way that they usually operate. Um, and I think then there's this sort of interesting kind of Scandinavian model where there's a, a natural collectivism um, going on. But, um, but the reason I said that is, is I was reading um, a piece of research the other day uh, about something called the trolley test, right? Now, the trolley test is this, this uh, thought experiment they've come up for, um, for, for self-driving cars. So they're trying to develop self-driving cars that can make decisions. And what, one of the questions they actually ask is, if the car was driving along and it went around the corner and there was a, a, you know, an old person standing in front of the car and the artificial intelligence made a calculation and it realized it could either save the people in the car, but it would end up running the person over, or it could save the person in the street, but in doing so would kill the people in the car. If it had to make that choice, which one would it do? And it's the classic dilemma of artificial intelligence. Um, but what was interesting about it is, is when that question is asked in, in more um, individualistic societies in Western Europe and America, uh, the answer a human being would always give is save the people in the car. But when they ask that question in, in places like Asia, in Taiwan, in China, in Japan, they say save the person in the street. So uh, it points to a more collectivist um, ideal out there in Asia. So, you know, to some extent, that's interesting, because to me, that's pointing to something that might look like socialism. So that's just giving me a, a sort of landscape of what I see in the world, you know, because my views about what it might be is, is irrelevant. I think what's important is what's happening and, and what can happen. So so to get to answer your question, you know, I, um, I live in Bradford. Um, I um, work out of the Impact Hub here in Bradford. Uh, obviously, I'm locked down at the moment, but when we can actually go out, I drive there every day. It's in Little Germany. I park my car in this car park, and it's next to the mural for the building where the Independent Labour Party started. And uh, and for me, I find that kind of interesting because when you look at what was going on that led to that moment, um, it was uh, it was very interesting. It was the mill workers in Bradford uh, were worried about um, cheap imports uh, eroding their wages. You know, and that's one of the things that started the conversation. And if you look at who the people were, they were actually Christian socialists. You know, so the uh, so the beginnings of that was like Methodism and the Quakers. It was the non-conformist Christian churches. Right. So so to me, there is the DNA of what I would call English socialism, which I think is ground up and it's grassroots and it's about community. You know, and uh, I think that's the starting point. That's what I'm interested in is how can groups of people work together essentially to be greater than some of the parts in such a way that no one's left out so i think that's my answer one of the one of the things i really love about um doing these interviews is people have just got such different answers but a lot of people a lot of people mention community um so what role do you see like community playing is that you mentioned different places in the world and i was really interested in mentioning that do you think other places have a different idea of socialism. Um, is this a uniquely British thing? Do you think this community thing, or you mentioned like Scandinavia, uh, where they seem to have a more natural collectivism? Just interested in exploring that a little bit. Yeah, well, I think um, you know I'll come to one of the reasons I was asked to uh, to uh, talk here today is I you know I wrote a book and and some people in the uh, the Labour Party, well, lots of different places, but Labour Party and various social enterprise social innovation centers have been interested in it, you know, and it's been used. So that's kind of what brought me here. And I got, so I did a lot of research for it. And I got quite interested in the word um, the word home. Because if you look at the origins of the word home, we tend to think now of a home as being a house, you know, a place. 
estate agents will even just refer to it as a house. But most of us would say a home is a house with stuff in it and nice vibe and people in it. But if you look at the origins and uh, in this country, it comes from the word ham. And you see that show up in Birmingham. It, you know, it's at the end of, of words that home actually meant village. It didn't mean a single place. So your home was the village you went to where, first of all, you were accepted, uh, that you were part of the community. And most importantly, you were safe. Because in those days, there wasn't like, you know, a big government to look after you. So the world was kind of scary. But you knew that once you got into your village, you got sort of into the perimeter of it, you were safe and looked after, you know. And so I think that's a starting point, you know, is that is the community, the, you know, a lot of people don't feel safe anymore. It's a sort of downside, I think, of globalization, but particularly, you know, things like the Internet, whereas you have access to everybody and you can connect with everybody, but you're part of nothing. You know, and I think uh, a lot of the um, anger and upset and fear in the West is this idea. I don't know where I belong and I don't know what I belong to. And I don't know who can I count on and I don't know who's going to look after me. You know, and I think that's what a community is. It tends to have been geographic in that it's a place, you know, but it's not necessarily geographic anymore. It can be a group of people who are dispersed, but are connected in some way and digital communications, like you know, what we're doing here, right? Um, allows you to connect, you know, uh, uh, independent of geography, but where you're actually got some kind of affinity and kinship with each other. So I think that's a starting point. I think that's what people want. And we saw the beginnings of that in the first lockdown, uh, where this kind of localization was beginning to happen. And I think that was very, very heartening. So, um, yeah, you've mentioned uh, the, the first lockdown. So you saw the beginnings of that community in the, in the first lockdown. Um, do you see it much happening? We're, we're in the middle of a second lockdown now. Do you see it happening now or, or, or has that gone? Well, I, th I think, of course, another thing that we've got, we've got to be careful with, it's so easy to draw conclusions from your own experience. You know, you know, I have an experience and I look on the Internet and I talk to people, but it's still a tiny experience. There could be all these amazing things happening out there I, I don't know about, you know. Um, I, and I think the other thing is we've got to, we're often not comparing like with like, you know, when people compare one country to another and they say, oh, you know, uh, wasn't it amazing that how, you know, New Zealand dealt with a lockdown or with, with COVID? It's like, well, yeah, but they've got a population half the size of, uh, of London and they don't have much international traffic. They still do a great job, but you can't really compare that to, the, to, um, um, to a, a country like the United Kingdom, which is very densely populated. And uh, I think it's a bit the same with lockdowns because there was a, a sense of newness in the first one, it was also really good weather. And I think that made a real difference. So we're in the middle of winter now. So I think that is bringing, and it's the second, you know, we'd be, we're now getting fatigued, you know. So I do think there isn't the kind of optimism and hope uh, there was in the first one because people got worn down. It's a bit like a war, you know, it goes on and on. Having said that, you know, I also think there's now beginnings of, um, uh, you know, of a lot of organizing going on. I've been very impressed how people have organized themselves around Zoom, for instance, which isn't the same as be in being in a community center or being in a park or being in a pub, but but it's still better than not having it, you know? And I think some really powerful, robust communities have started to form. Um, and particularly, you know, local organizing um, is still kind of going on and um, in some places, you know, as far as I can see. So um, I'm going to now come on to the reason, you know, that we were put in contact with each other. Uh, Tina McKay, who was interviewed a couple of weeks ago on the show, put us in contact with, in, with one another. Can you tell me a little bit about the links with Tina? Yeah, sure. So Tina was the Labour candidate in, um, in Colchester in Essex, where I was living at the time. Um, I won't talk about myself too much, but just a little bit of context is I was born up here in Yorkshire, um, I, um, I left, um, I moved down to the south of England, I lived in Australia and Asia for a while, and then I came back to the UK, and then I've come right back to where I started 35 years later. So that's kind of what's happened to me. So um, two years ago, I was, I was down in Essex. And um, one of the reasons I went on that journey, I was doing research for, uh, for a book called The Participation Revolution, uh, which really forms my thinking that we're talking about today. And what I was interested in is I'd, I'd begun initially to see that um, companies would be I was interested why things like Google and Facebook and Instagram sort of exploded onto the scene you know so I started off being interested in that and then as I dug into it I realized that the world was changing so what I was interested in is you know how is the world changing why is the world changing and and, and what are we going to do as we move into this new uncertain time we're in and that's really what the book's about you know and um I uh was asked to teach a module at Cambridge Business School I've got a set something called the Centre of Social Innovation 
and they asked me to teach a module there based on the thinking in it. And uh, that was great. And as I left that place, someone said, your book's great, Neil, but have you ever done this? And I went, oh, no, I haven't. So uh, so when I went back to uh, Colchester, what I started to do was work on something which we, we called it the South Lanes Project, but it was the idea of, of how we could build uh, a community in the middle of town, you know, a community within the community, which is very grassroots, uh, which is connecting up all the independent businesses, all the arts businesses together to, to be something, you know, and I, I started to do that and it started to get some traction and all sorts of other interesting things happened in terms of the empire striking back. And that's when I met Tina, you know, and she was, she went, this is great. This is socialism. And I thought, I hadn't really thought of it like that, but I thought, well, it's organizing groups of people to build communities that are looking after each other. So maybe it is. And uh, that's kind of what led me here today, I think. So um, do you have a copy of your book with you? Just so I, that uh... I do. And the shameless plug, the, yeah, they're, they're, shameless plug. We, we, we have no shame here about plugging and, uh, and celebrating people's uh, celebrating people's work. So, yeah. Um, so with with that book um, and with the project, actually, I'm really interested in the project because uh, I'm dead keen on reading the book now. Um, but with the project, you, you spoke about the arts there. How hmm. did these things connect together? How did the, how did you manage to like? create something i'm assuming you did create something where uh, those communities were working together a lot more cohesively yeah yeah so uh, sort of you know like any research you do like heaps of research and then and then you kind of like surface bits of it so when i was doing research for the book i one of the fascinating stories i read was about the world's first shopping mall which was in uh, minneapolis in the states and uh, and it created the model for the shopping malls that we've seen around the world which you know were the kind of these kind of temples of consumerism and what was interesting was it was started by a very left-leaning socialist Swede. And, uh, and that area of, um, of America was where uh, the Scandinavians tended to move, where Swedish people moved. And what he was interested in was bringing the... So he, he looked around and went, there's kind of no community here. So he said, I'd like to build a Swedish town, you know, with its centre and, and all the things, that, including shops, right? But put a roof over it because we can now do that, right? So that was the idea. So that started the model. And then as it went on and money came in, they sort of went, well, yeah, but we're not going to do the library because we can't afford it. And we're not going to do the church. And so eventually it became his model stripped of all the civil amenities just with shops, right? And uh, it must have been very frustrating and frustrating for him. And so the shopping mall was born, you know? And, um, and why I share that was because, you know, I think, if you look at the way our towns evolved, they evolved exactly the same. It's centers that had amenities where people came to share all sorts of things, including produce. And then over, particularly since the 80s, a lot of them have been stripped, stripped and stripped until they're just full of shops and there's nothing else there. And then what's interesting now is a lot of those shops are closing because of uh, you know, the internet and e-commerce and just changes in what people are interested in. So, uh, so um, you know, what, what we were interested in was how do you build a community? And we had these three things that we talked about. We talked about, um, we talked about community. So that was about social connection, people gathering to do things, to talk about things. We talked about creativity, which is people coming uh, to, to do things like sort of making, um, performing. And then we talked about commerce, which is an important part as well, but particularly local commerce where the, uh, the stores were run by local people and you could get things that you can't get on the internet, basically. That was the thing we used to say was not on the internet. So we were interested in, in, in formulating around those three things. So that's kind of what the project was about. So what sort of things weren't on the internet then? What isn't on the internet is actually, um, you know, this is a future of retailing conversation if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but what what is uh what is not on the internet is service and and experience so um you know getting a tattoo going into a vaping shop having your hair cut going and having a cup of tea you know those things are not on the internet uh and if you are selling something like you know you're a record shop or something like that what isn't on the internet is being able to go in and meet a real geek who knows all about music you know who can tell you about it and they probably have a band on and you can come in and all that kind of thing and they sell CDs, records, and things like that. So it's that kind of human experience is really what it's about. And that's what we were really focusing on. And we work with a lot of shops to help them change their viewpoint. You know, they were used to having stuff. You know, how do you draw people into your store so there's something else to be to go there for other than just to buy the things on the pegs? And and, and, and it worked well. You know, I think there's some nice success stories come out of that project. With regards to music and things like that, did you find that the people were collaborating with music? Did people like did people who were creating music 
support one another. Yeah, and I, th- I think you begin to get to what I think is the future of socialism now. And um, you know, I, I, I um, we we're talking a little bit beforehand, you know, about this this word organizing, you know, and um, um, social organizing. And I think in political parties, people tend to think that organizing is organizing people to get votes for them. But I think really the future of political movements is organizing people so they can do you make things happen in their community. And a lot of that is connecting people together. And, and music's a great example, I think, of, uh, of this wonderful word that I um, discovered again when I was doing research, which comes from gaming theory, which is cooperation. Like, what the hell does that mean? Cooperation is when you have collaboration and competition. And really, it seems to be as a very vibrant community has those. And music's a really great example because every musician wants to kind of be top of the pops, right? They want people to come to their their gig. They want to be successful. But also they collaborate it with each other to make all of them successful. So there's this kind of ecosystem. And, you know, like the Football League is a great example. You know, Manchester United or Newcastle or Liverpool, whoever you support, couldn't succeed if there wasn't a league with other teams in it. So they need those other teams to be kind of successful, as successful as they're nearly, but of course they also want to beat them, right? So uh, I thought it was a really good, once you get people together who are, and when I use the word creative, I think all human beings are creative. People are trying to do something. There's people with allotments, people with recycling, people with music, people doing things like a lot of vintage stuff, you know, um, and, and getting groups of people together to create situations where they could do things together. Uh, and it worked, it worked really well. And I think that kind of organizing is, when you say it's the only thing that's missing, I mean, it's quite, it's not easy, right? But that's what I think really people were looking for is how do we organize ourselves together? When you um when you see then the way political parties campaign and when you see people knocking on doors, which I actually always think this is quite an intrusive thing to do. Yeah. To so someone is probably doing something else, they're probably having like, you know, they're maybe having their only time with the family all week or they're maybe just cooking or doing something like that, and you go and you knock on the door and you're basically going there to collect data. Now that's a really weird thing to do. So what would you say like to that, what would you say whether that's a good model to knock on doors? And also, what would an alternative to that be? Like, you know, should should political party campaigning just be data collection? Well, I don't think you can beat. Uh, how can you say you can't? You can't sort of beat something by trying to emulate it. And I think um, if you look at the political parties that you know the, the big political parties, and there's only really two in the UK sort of three but uh but certainly if you count the liberals because they were you know one of the founding political parties so it's these three political movements labor liberal if we'll call them that and the tories they're all born out of um the 1900s and before um the factory system uh the class system which is very very stratified and they rep they represent that they're top down they're london based they have someone at the top of the pile which is just like a ceo you know, and then they have the next, they have the kind of, you know, the leadership team and they have the middle management and then they have the foot soldiers, you know, and the Labour Party has organised itself exactly like Liberal Democrats and exactly like the Tories. And you don't solve a problem by using the thinking that came from the, the problem was created by. I mean, I can't remember who came, said that, but that's a quote from someone. But so I think the, the way forwards is to is to operate differently. And I think it's grassroots and it's local. So you have to look at models that have worked. Now, you know, it's quite a controversial model I'm going to suggest, but if you look at sort of how um, organizations have quite often been deemed terrorist organizations work, how the IRA operated, how the PLO have operated, I'm not saying whether I think they are, but, you know, would quite often be in the mainstream media would be described as such, um, how the mafia has worked. Um, what they do is they do an awful lot of local social organizing. So what happens is you've got people on the ground doing good. You know, um, there's certainly perhaps providing money, but the main thing is kind of providing the infrastructure so that the schools work, so that food is created, you know. So that's that's maybe, depending on your viewpoint, not a great example, but I'm like, copy the system. It doesn't matter why it's happening. And I think that sort of system where um, you're operating and you're known to be operating in the local community. So when you come and knock on the door, rather than going, we haven't seen you for four years, <laughs> it's like, well, you know, we've been doing all this stuff and we'd like to talk to you and how's it going and give us some kind of feedback, you know, and uh, yeah, um, yeah, what would you like and how can you be involved? So that it's not them and us anymore. It's like all of us. 
and you're just the person knocking on the door who's the representative of the person catching the data. And I think that's how I'd like to see us moving. And uh, we've seen a bit of that working very well, particularly around food banks, the way that the, the labor activists have got involved in food banks. And they, you know, it's very, it's not doing it to win votes. It's doing it because people care about it passionately. Uh, it's authentic and they want to do it. But of course, what people are experiencing is people helping out in a social problem. Um, and I think that's the future, as far as I'm concerned. That's the participation revolution. Um, you mentioned food banks there. Now, there's a little bit of, um, I don't know, maybe people are going there for photo opportunities a little bit now. Do you think someone's kind of caught on to this, this idea that actually that work that people are doing in food banks is something that could benefit them? Because we've got like Tory MPs who were responsible for voting to make people poor and therefore there's a necessity for food banks and then they go and have the photo taken at a food bank. Do you think there's a, the catching on to the idea? Of course. And, you know, and I think what I'd like to see is that, you know, what, what really saddens me is the amount of squabbling that goes on and the battling, you know, the keyboard warriors and all that sort of stuff. Do people get involved in that because they want to look good? Absolutely. Do they turn up for the photo opportunity? Yes. This thing called virtue signaling, all those things. Absolutely. You know, but meanwhile, there's a lot of other people just getting on with it. You know, and I think that's what I'm interested in. If you, I used to call um, local councillors where I, I was down in Essex puddle pointers, because all they'd ever do was uh, you'd see them on social media pointing at a pothole saying, oh, something needs to be done about this. And I'm like, great. Well, why don't you fill it in? <laughs> you know? so, um, so I think, yeah, of course, you know, and, uh, and that, that's always happened and always will happen. But you know what? The people in the communities won't fall for that shit. You know, the people, some, some people on social media might, but they'll see the person turn up, wave with their PPE on, shake a hand and disappear again. But what they'll really see is the people who are left behind actually day after day, week after week getting involved. It's funny, there'll be a lot of people who wouldn't consider themselves socialists who who would like to get involved in all those things that you've described. So earlier on, you mentioned that Tina said, to you, oh, that's socialism. So how did that develop your feelings around socialism, having not really thought about it being a socialist thing before? Well, I think I think it's when I, I, I felt that we need a we need a reboot. You know, we need to let go of the um, we, we, yeah, we're going through, uh, you know, again, a belief. And, and uh, I did the research for this over 10 years. It came out nearly so nearly four years ago now. Um, and then, you know, the world has moved on a lot. And I think it just validates what I was saying, which isn't original thinking, but is becoming more mainstream, that we're going through a profound um, societal transformation. You know, it's been driven by uh, digital technology. Every societal transformation is driven by new technologies. The Industrial Revolution was driven by, you know, the, the steam engine and the blast furnace that allowed mechanization, that allowed factories to be built, you know, and, and the paradigm of the last 200 years is based on that. We're now entering a new paradigm, and I think it's the opportunities are for um, uh, new parties to emerge. And what I'd say is that the right have been better at this than the left. You know, they've really got hold of quite often because the far right, you know, because they've been forced underground, you know, the way they they use social media, they use WhatsApp, the way that they use, you know, things like YouTube um, has been forgetting about what they're talking about. But as a mechanism, as uh, is something to be uh, to model uh, and and to follow, you know, so I I think, um, you know, what I was pointing to is I don't, I don't even need another name. But, you know, quite often it's a problem when you've got a brand name, because on the one hand, you don't want to lose it. On the other hand, it's kind of got the past hanging on to it. <laughs> you know? So it's like we need socialism 2.0 to use a bit of a cliche. So. Yeah, that's kind of the kind of the, one of the points of this channel is to detoxify the word socialism, because a lot of people just use it as an insult and they have no idea what it actually means and what it means to certain people and people who self-describe as socialists. And it's really nice like kind of having that discussion around whether or not we do need a, a different word. I know a lot of people use progressive now in the USA rather than necessarily socialist because socialism is so toxic there as a word. So is that something, do you think we need to move away from socialism as a, as a word? I don't know. Uh, you know we, and if so, it will have to evolve. You know, I, I was very impressed by Andrew Yang in the, uh, the you know, the Democrat candidate. And because I thought he had different ideas and he was managing, I think, to present some ideas which you could call socialist in a, using completely different language. And it wasn't just a language thing. He was presenting them in a very modern way. He's a you know, product of Silicon Valley, but he didn't get much traction. And I think you know, the flip side of it having no 
baggage is people don't get it you know the, uh, so so i think it has to be dare i say progressive you know that it will be will be emergent and um you know any any the meaning of language changes over time and as new generations come up you know i think the other thing we are seeing here is a generational shift you know the jeremy corbyn and john mcdonnell were very much the sort of you know product of a of an older generation and you know, they did amazing stuff, but uh, moving on. And now you've got a younger generation that you're seeing in with a lot of the new MPs and particularly women MPs, right, who uh, who've just um, got a different relationship with it, you know? A couple of years ago, it looked like the Labour Party were going to have a bit of a grassroots revolution. And the whole idea was to have power put into the hands of, of local parties. And, that. and we're now kind of seeing that go the opposite direction under Keir Starmer's leadership. Do you think that's a wise decision or do you think that's a, a fair comment by me as well? Yeah, well, I, uh, but, you know, maybe it's being a little bit older, I don't know, but uh, I also, what I've done for a living, I spent a lot of my life um, working on organisations, big complex organisations and how you, how you change them. And what I've learned by getting my fingers burnt a lot is that culture is very powerful. Um, when you uh, try and change a culture, even if it's for the good, uh, the the empire will strike back if you like you know um, and and often the best uh, moments when you look back over history are the worst moments you know it's when things are often born as they're often born out of um, uh, you know difficult times uh, you know the, the Thatcher years are a really good example I mean I don't think anyone on the left would look at the Thatcher years as great years on the other hand because of what was going on, it's incredible how much was born out of that in terms of music, in terms of um, left-wing movements, in terms of feminism, in terms of the lesbian and gay movement. So much of that was as a reaction to what was going on, you know? So I think what we're seeing is a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction, the fading of the, uh, is it the raging of the dying light uh, uh, going on at the moment, um, which um, will run its course. And meanwhile, behind the scenes, I think you're beginning to see the seeds of something new growing. So it's, um, I wouldn't say it's about being patient, but I think these things often take longer than we'd like them to. Um, with regards to, I'm going to go back a little bit now. With regards to the the project that you um, that you started, were young people heavily involved in that? Was this something that young people took on? Was this like a, a multi-age kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I think I think this is. Well, I don't want to be is that old guy talking about young people, you know, like, <laughs> but, but to some extent, I suppose I'm going to. But, you know, I, I think um, I think it, 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 there's an inevitability to, to what happens is that we're all young at some point and we get older. And I've seen it in a lot of my friends at the moment. You know, what happens is you get older, you become more conservative. And I don't think that's necessarily politically or even socially conservative. It's just the idea that conservative means trying to conserve the status quo. Right. Um, because, you know, without realizing it, your interests are being served and then a younger generation comes along and they want to do things differently. You know, and, and so it's always been. Right. So to some extent, I don't think we're in any any more. You know, it's just another version of it. But the, the times are harder. And when the times are harder, there's more of a need for change. You know, and I think there's a real desire for change in an awful lot of young people. And the frustration is kind of how do we get in? Because it's like all the doors are shut, you know, you can't buy cheap property anymore kind of thing. You can't seem to get infiltrate the political parties. There isn't anything for me, you know. So so I found that once, and, and you know, I don't want to generalise, but I found a real desire just to do good. And by do good, I don't even mean in a kind of worthy way. Just do good stuff, you know, play music, have fun, build things, you know. Um, and, and, and so once you kind of gave people pathways to do that, they really got involved, you know. Um, I was really encouraged by that, you know. Uh, but I think there's a fragility, and I don't think this is an age thing. I think what we're seeing at the moment is there's been so much disappointment. I see this in Bradford, where I live, you know, so much generational disappointment of false starts and politicians getting up and saying what they say and then, like, it not working out. Um, the, um, if something goes wrong, people very quickly get disillusioned. So I think the real leadership skill we have to help, we have to develop uh, in, in ourselves is the ability to get people through those moments when things inevitably go wrong and go, OK, you know, shit happens, basically. Never mind. We pick ourselves up and keep going. You know, and I think I think in socialism, it's a time 
by that now is we just, you know, everyone's saying, I want to leave the party. It's like, no, now is the time to dust ourselves down, you know, heal and grieve and then crack on kind of thing. You know? It's interesting what you're saying about like kind of that. I think what you're talking about is hope a lot. And I think one of the yeah, things in is. 2017 in the election, it was such a hopeful campaign and it was summer and everyone was like, you know, those those things were happening. The, the campaign was fun. There were stadiums, there were there were gigs going on. And then in 2019, it was just like a, a barrage of um, of people just being under attack, really. And like, what do you think about this Brexit policy? And what do you think about it? And And it wasn't fun. It was a, a really dour campaign. Do you think that played a part in... I don't think really people have talked about that very much in the analysis of it. Do you think that could have played a part in the outcomes of both those elections? Well, you know, we get into this area which I try and steer away from, which is opinions about what went wrong, uh, because, um, you know, no one really knows, right? And there's no controlled experiment we can put it against, you know. And often these things are complex, you know. Uh, I think the important thing, if you want to kind of reform, is to look up, not that it's your fault, but look at what we did that we can, because you can talk about the media and you can talk about the Tories and you can talk about all the stuff they do, right? And and it, 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 it's not all true, but most of it's true. But the point is, we can't change that. So what, you know, what could we have done differently, you know? And um, one of the things I talk about in my book, which I've become really sure about, and I've, I've, I've seen this in so many places, is what I call clarity of purpose, right? Is what people want is clarity. And why, why I think Jeremy Corbyn got in, you can talk about all his policies and what he stood for, but if you look back to when he was, you know, it wasn't meant to kind of win the leadership election, you had a bunch of kind of people who were sort of bumbly, sort of focus group kind of characters. And then this guy who was just really sure about what he believed. And you're like, it's almost like, I don't care what you believe. I just love the fact that, you, you know, that you're authentic, right? Um, and I think that's important. And obviously what he believes is important. But I think a lot of it was the fact that this conviction politician, conviction leadership, you know, and that conviction got lost because the Labour Party didn't have a conviction around the most important thing in that in that election, which was Brexit, whether you liked it or not. And I think that's something, I, if, with hindsight, be like, you have to kind of go one way or the other, <laughs> really. That means you're going to please some people and piss them off, but trying to kind of go some please all the people all the time, it's an old cliche, is not going to help anybody. And, I, and that's, that's the, I think, the difference. You know? Whereas if we'd all known where we stood, and you could even go, you know, what? I don't agree with that. So I'm going to go off and go with someone else. At least there would have been, I think, a lot more hope there. But that's just my view. A lot of other people would say it was about other things. <laughs> after, after everything we've discussed, um, how do we build a kind of a more socialist society? How do we build towards the models you were saying? And I know what from what you were saying, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who are working in councils, um, maybe local councillors and stuff who are really interested in building that model. I'm going to do this in two parts. The first one is how do we build that um, locally, that grassroots organising, that grassroots kind of community feel? And then how do we do it either during or post-COVID? When we're in a problem, we're suffering. We're, you know, we're suffering many different levels at the moment. Um, I would say you know, one of the intriguing things going forward is um, if there was a COVID you know 23 i hope there isn't but if there was right uh and there was a government standing up on stage and they had experts around them i'd like to see them having experts in you know uh, in viruses but i'd also like to see them having experts in, in in sociology psychology uh in 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 human need because you know what this has shown is this, the word social is in socialism is that human beings are social creatures. We're not individuals. We want to connect. We want to be with other people. And what this, you know, a lot, especially people have been on their own during this time, it's really, really hard not to be connected to other human beings. So there is an opportunity now, people, because people often have to experience not having something <laughs> before they can like go, okay, what are we going to do, you know, going forward? So um, I think that's, um, that's, that's a good starting point, you know? Um, and the other thing I think is about local organizing and, and quite often we like complex solutions, uh, but I think it's a, a simple solution, but it's complex to, to actually do. And it's, a, and it's this, that, um, you know, what intrigued me, what got, talk, got me talking to the Labour Party again was a paper that I think Jeremy Corbyn, I don't think he sanctioned, but was very keen on, which was called From Paternalism to Participation. Now, given my book was called The Participation Revolution, you can see why I was interested in it, right? And in that simple thing is, is, is everything. 
because we have a paternalistic approach that we have to help people. We have to look after them. We have to give them this. And I think I think what we need to move to is a participatory model where leadership becomes about empowering and enabling groups of people to do things. You know, because that's where as human beings, we begin to feel good when we're not having things done for us, usually badly, <laughs> but that we actually have the means ourselves as communities. It doesn't mean I'm doing everything myself, but my community has the means to look after itself. It has the means to provide its own power. It has the means to kind of feed itself. And then we feel we're kind of empowered. And I think I think that's the, the skills we need to develop. And certainly that's where councils, I think, can be because uh, they, they, they feel like they should do things for people where a council's job is not to do a lot of stuff because how would a council know how to regenerate an area economically? The council can provide the ecosystem, it can provide the tools, it can provide money, uh, and it can provide certain kind of leadership skills that allows the people within that community then to thrive. So I think that's kind of basically my whole ethos. Do you think, though, that the, the power structures that we have don't lend themselves to giving away power People have worked very, very hard to get themselves into positions of authority, whether that's leader of the Labour Party, whether that's prime minister. Does it kind of, is it a bit of a paradox that these people really don't, once they've got power, don't really want to give it to other people? Because yeah. the goal of power should be to really to share it with people, because I completely agree that grassroots organising and giving people the power to do what they want to do should really be the end goal for us. And, and it should be the way society works. But is our system kind of not really set up for that? Is it paradoxical? Yeah, I think it's a good point. You know, I read that the, um, you know, there's a point, again, forgetting about whether you think the British Empire was a good thing or a bad thing or whatever. But, you know, there's a point when uh, the British Empire was running about two thirds of the world and there was 40,000 civil servants. There's now a million. Um, so <laughs> because, you know, what, what those civil servants were doing was actually engaging an awful lot with local things going on locally, again, forgetting about just whether you actually agree with what was happening, but from an organizing principle, you know, absolutely. And what's interesting in China, where which we would probably see as very top down and hierarchical, what lots of Chinese companies are down is, is just literally taking out the whole middle management. And so you've got a fairly lean governance body, which is almost like a almost like a sort of venture capitalist, you know, where they're actually just kind of giving out money and resources to people. And then you have all these kind of teams on the ground who are doing things so uh yeah if you give human being a job any human being will make sure they're busy so if you have an awful lot of people in the in the middle of an organization they'll make sure they're doing something so uh that is a paradox you know how do you actually change that system uh and every time you see something happening on the ground um that power there's a natural reaction to try and uh quash it and I just think that's human nature. You know, it happened in the Labour Party when when Jeremy Corbyn came along. But I don't think it's because people are evil. I just think it's kind of how they were organised and 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 what what tends to happen. So uh, so you know, how we change bottom up is 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 an interesting challenge. You know, uh, and the, the the empire will always strike back. And I I think you saw that with the uh, the first lockdown. I think it's instinctive. I think the government were like, oh my god, all these people are organising. <laughs> Like, quick, send Jared, you know, send Dominic Cummings up to <laughs> up to the northeast, you know, to kind of demoralize everyone. You know, I don't, I don't know if it was thought through, but you know, it was almost like a natural reaction, you know. So, uh, uh, but that's a challenge, you know. We've got to keep going. It's it's really interesting what you say about middle management. I often find that um, middle management in companies actually create work in a lot of occasions is that your experience of that yeah but i think it's interesting because you know there's certainly been i think of mistakes in the past where where you know um say the labor party has looked to the private sector for um for uh, you know steer but actually i think what's happening in corporations now is really interesting because because there's, there's there's this kind of movement which you know gets gets called kind of almost lately the agile movement but where what you're seeing is a profound reorganization uh, particularly driven by technology, where the where middle management is disappearing slowly but surely, and the bottom of the organisation is growing and it's becoming a lot more self-organising and a lot more collaborative. And that's quite you know it's happening in banks, it's happening in 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 you know water companies, in in large capital projects. And uh, I think that's really interesting. So uh, so there is something I think that we can learn from there. And and it's a journey, like any journey. I hate to say that, because it's a cliche. It's a journey, but it is. You know, it's gonna it's gonna take time for that new model to uh, to to take over. But you know, the 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 um, success of anything like that is that it's successful, and I think it's being seen to make people happier and more productive, and actually 
you know, they make the company's making more money. So that's a, a sign that it will probably continue to thrive. Absolutely brilliant. So, um, right. I know that we need to buy your book in order to get all the details of how to, how we go about this, but is there any like kind of one tip that we could get people on the ball rolling? Is there any like one thing that will help people create this successful model where you've got local, really socialist models, but you can call them whatever you want. Um, and, and where people can support each other and empower one another. Yeah. Well, first of all, you don't have to buy the book. Um, and, um, uh, you can also see if you type into Google and type TEDx Bradford Neil Gibb, you'll see a TED talk where I essentially give the whole of the book away. So that might be a, an easier way to to uh, to find out about it. But um, you know, the, really, I, in the book, I talk about all sorts of things, loads of different case studies. But I boil it down to three principles, and I say they all have to be there. You know, I talk about clarity of purpose, the purpose driven organisation, and I would say as a society, we no longer have a common purpose. And that is the biggest skill any leadership needs. And it's missing in lots of European countries. It's missing in America at the moment. And it's missing in the UK. You know, this sense of that we can see why we're here and what we're all trying to trying to do together. So that's the first thing, you know, that kind of clarity of purpose. The second thing is to empower people to participate. So in other words, giving people the means to participate, to fulfill on that purpose. And we began to see that particularly in the first election that Jeremy Corbyn was leading in, where momentum allowed people to be involved, to be taking part, right? That was a participatory model. And we need a participatory society where we feel like we're contributing to society. And the third thing, a crucial thing, is around that is a community that you identify with, you feel part of, and you feel safe in. And it's no one of those things. All three have to be present at the same time. And if you have that, you have a very powerful organisation. That is definitely something for us all to work towards, I think. So um, I am going to say thank you there, Neil, because uh, I have learned so much today and uh, it's a lot for me to take in. So I'm kind of thinking, how can I do this? How can I put this into, into action locally? How can I help other people to put this into action locally? And I hope people do listen to this message and, and really try to do something because it's more important than ever, I think, t for us to try to do something together um it, especially like sort of post covid we're going to need to help one another out and i think that's a huge deal there's a, a, a couple of uh, sort of adverts although they're both not for profit adverts but you know uh, i'm um uh, an advisor to the impact hub here in um in bradford so there's a few impact hubs around the the country and there's a thing called civic square in um in birmingham which are really interesting places which are places you can go and connect with other people who are all about social innovation and then me and a few other people have created something called the grow program which will be running the second one in february which is really about training people uh by doing uh to be uh social entrepreneurs so that's you know both of those things that people can get involved in so. thank you so much so i'd encourage everyone to get involved with that thanks neil thank you paul that's great The red flag flying here